It's uh, great to see so many friends here this evening and so many people who are friends for the future. Um, I said to Sagampi, our head of department, as everybody was coming in, I said, my life is flashing in front of my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> as people I've known for a long time and fairly recently um, all came along. So it's, it's very nice to see everybody. Uh, this is going to be quite a casual talk, uh, which is a way, a polite way of saying you may not learn anything very new. <laughs> Um, and uh, it is very much uh, some personal reflections uh, on corpus linguistics in 2017. I do remember, <laughs> being old enough, when corpus linguistics was a very new thing. And I remember going to a meeting of the Linguistics Association of Great Britain um, when it was described as this new fashion. Um, of course, it has moved on very much since then, and it's moved on so much that I must admit I'm beginning to feel a little bit like a dinosaur in the world of um, corpus linguistics, partly because that how it is how I really feel, and partly because clip art has a lot of cool pictures of dinosaurs so I got quite involved um, in that. So I'm going to talk, structure my talk around five moves or turns in corpus linguistics which I think are observable. I'll be thinking about the influence of corpus linguistics on various aspects of linguistics but also about the influence of these changes on corpus linguistics itself. It looks as though I'm going to say five important things, but actually there are only two main takeaway notes. One is that I think the statistical man manipulation of corpora is the new corpus driven and construction grammar offers a reinterpretation of units of meaning and grammar patterns. But the first thing I'm going to talk about <laughs> is the continued trend towards specialisation in corpus linguistics, by which I mean simply compiling corpora of quite specific text types. It isn't a particularly new trend, of course, but perhaps worth commenting on. And if we doubted it, that corpus linguistics increasingly looks at specialised texts, here are some examples from this year's conference. And I'm just going through this from the programme. Very specific genres such as academic biodata um, or school textbooks, specific topics such as Romanian migrants, harassment, careers and employability, specific sources such as the Daily Express or online forums and just some more. So we are, of course, familiar with the role corpus linguistics plays in assisting the investigation of discourse and the contribution it makes to other disciplines, whether this is a humanities discipline such as stylistics um, or the many social sciences assisted by, for example, the um, CAS Centre at Lancaster University. As Baker, Partington, Toole and Marlberg and many others have pointed out combining corpus techniques with discourse analysis makes the corpus analysis more robust and enables latent patterns to be observed. And by latent patterning I mean word collocations, phrases, meanings that are significant in a discourse but which can't be observed as frequent by looking at individual texts alone. 
What corpus linguistics does is to rearrange the data, in this case words and tag categories, so that the patterning is more easily observed. And what this does to, um, is to demonstrate and assert the centrality of corpus linguistics to linguistics <coughs> itself. And by, it also provides a service to linguistics by demonstrating and asserting the centrality of linguistics to all intellectual endeavour. And for this audience, that's not surely not too great a claim to make. More specifically, what corpus linguistics in the study of specialised discourses shows is that the detail of form really matters. How something is said is important. And accumulation really matters. Repetition of a form and a message creates salience. So it's all good. But what about the other way around? And now we think about the influence of the study of specialised discourse on corpus linguistics. One possibly negative effect, one pos positive, one neutral. Corpus linguistics continues to develop as a mainstream methodology. It's no longer only a fashion, but a bedrock of how linguistics is done. And it tends to take on a service role in relation to other disciplines. The tried and tested methods may be valued more than innovation in methodology. Having said that, servicing other disciplines can have its advantages, and what Hardy and Baker have called the helicopter effect of studying specific discourses is one such. The third influence is in reinvigorating the debate about register and the totality of a language. Doug Biber has argued, for example, that there's no such thing as general English. Uh, there are only individual registers. Increasing the specificity of texts, moving beyond register perhaps, both demonstrates the importance of comparing corpora and raises the question of the optimum level of specificity of description. So I'm now moving on to the next point. And this point is the modality effect. What I'm talking about here basically is the kind of linguistic and other semiotic texts incorporated in into corpus linguistics that has grown exponentially from the early necessary focus on written text to an increasing emphasis on spoken text to signed text and then on to images and to gestures and similarly we trace a development in sources available when I first started an association with co-build there was a large, very large cupboard full of books that had been torn to pieces so that they could each, each page by page could be put through a scanner and that was the only way of getting the books into a corpus. Well, that was a long time ago. So we have the scanned books of the early 80s right through to published and unpublished materials to the more ephemeral texts the tweets and other forms of social media coming on to the one I've heard about most recently from my colleague Ruth Page which is Snapchat. I have no idea what that is <laughs> but they tell me it exists and you can study. And the influence of this on corpus linguistics I think is an explosion of methodologies responding to non-linear forms of text, to non-standard texts, to very short, very numerous texts, and indeed to temporary texts. And as you can see, this is way beyond my area of expertise, so I'm going to move on fairly quickly from that. I'm going to move on to an area where I have no more expertise, but where I have more to say. <laughs> quantity 
has always lain at the heart of corpus linguistics. From early observations, intuitive observations of what is most frequent, through measures of significance, to today's more sophisticated and complex statistical um, <coughs> techniques. I want to make the argument that corpus work that starts with statistical manipulation of text might be termed the new corpus driven. Now this term comes of course from Tonini Bonelli's distinction between corpus based and uh, corpus driven. Corpus based research which builds on known categories and corpus driven research which seeks to derive new categories from raw observation. Corpus driven research is often linguistically naive with observations about categories emerging from the data that don't necessarily coincide with pre-existing linguistic knowledge. Although the debate between corpus-based and corpus-driven has largely passed into history, and the dichotomy nowadays is more likely to be treated as a climb, I do think that the notion of corpus-driven can usefully, usefully be applied to studies that start not from the word, as Tonini Bonelli did, um, but from the numbers. And to return to a point I made earlier, corpus investigation is about rearranging the data, facilitating the observation of pattern. When that rearrangement is carried out statistically, it's quantitatively sophisticated but linguistically naive. It basically uses a bag of words. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give two examples from work with which I have been associated, although um, uh, the person who was mostly responsible for the work uh, is somebody other than myself. Uh, so it's not exactly plagiarism, but I am borrowing from this <laughs> work. What these studies have in common is that in each case, numbers were used. And I use numbers, you know, because that's what people like me understand, numbers. Um, numbers were used to derive lists of words that tend to co-occur, not in the sense of collocation within a three-word span, five-word span, but within the same text or subcorpus. Um, I spent quite a lot of my research life looking at lists of words and putting them into categories putting them into lists of words that have similar meanings. But that was me and my colleagues sitting there and doing that. In each of the examples I'm going to talk about, that task was done statistically, with human intervention only in selecting and applying the statistics, only. Um, I've spoken about each of these studies before, so I'm going to go over them fairly briefly. The first example is work by Neil Miller on the appalling website RateMyProfessors.com, <laughs> where people write about the professors who have taught them and how wonderful or how dreadful they are. Um, Neil Miller was interested in the adjectives and in which adjectives were used by the community of writers who were describing each professor. To, so he, he was interested in which adjectives most significantly co-occur in the texts about each professor. So each professor's texts uh, comprise a kind of subcorpus. Um, to oversimplify what he did, he used um, uh, PCA to derive lists of adjectives which were likely to co-occur. For example, a professor approved of as being intelligent, as in the first list on the slide, was likely also to be described as brilliant, interesting and smart. Not necessarily by the same writer, but by another writer evaluating the same professor. We can add mnemonic labels to these groups, in this case intelligence and helpfulness, 
But the groups themselves were driven by the numbers, not created um, by Neil or by myself. So here are two of the groups, with the first few adjectives in each group and the mnemonic. The lists themselves simply answer the question, what do writers talk about when they rate their professors? And it's not surprising that what they talk about is how intelligent the professor is and how helpful the professor is. Um, but the numbers made lists are capable of offering another perspective. The words inspiring, engaging and interesting are put in the same group as intelligent, smart, and so on. And this suggests to us that for the writers, intelligence is valued insofar as it has a positive effect on the student or the consumer. Um, we might say that this group of adjectives commodifies education. This is the voice of the student as the consumer of the intelligence of the professor. When we turn to the helpfulness group, on the other hand, we see words such as available and approachable, as well as helpful and sweet, and so on. The presence of these words suggests that students being able to talk to professors is something to be remarked on in the feedback. It suggests a level of humility, perhaps at odds with the consumer view of the intelligence groups, it's the voice of the student as subordinate. And we can make similar comments about the negative adjectives. Here are two groups that we have labelled rudeness and incompetence. Notice that the incompetence group uh, again positions the student as the consumer, chastising the professor for the feelings engendered in the students. <coughs> But the most harsh adjective, unprofessional, is used by students not in conjunction with incompetence, but in the other interpersonal group alongside rude and mean and so on. As Neil Miller has said, you can be anything you like with students except rude. My second example may again be familiar to you and it comes from work which I'm going to credit to Akira Murakami. This is based on the corpus of research articles from the journal Global and Environmental Change and it um, identifies words which in the corpus as a whole tend to co-occur in stretches of text at least 300 words long. So a couple of paragraphs. So these are some of the uh, lists of words which, as I say, tend to co-occur within a couple of paragraphs. Some of them are very observable, recognisable as topics. We have a kind of forest topic, a kind of risk topic, and some are less recognisable as topics. So if one was doing this manually with a list of words that are frequent in this journal, for example, one might pick out the first of these and the second, but less likely to pick out the third and the fourth. And there are various kinds of topic which I'm just going to zip through because I want to come on to the, second, the next point the main point, which is that deriving the list statistically in a way that ignores their meaning, and the lists are put together without anybody looking at them and thinking about it, throws up some surprises that I think would be missed if we started with a method that involved the meaning of words. For example, the word agriculture occurs in two lists, one to do with crops, one to do with livestock, and the similar word farm occurs not in those lists, but in another list that centres on farming as a localised human activity rather than uh, an economic one. And also what we see from these lists are topics that are shaped by the texts they occur in or are construed by. In other words, the lists make up topics that are unique to this corpus, to this journal. 
For example, there are lists that combine the names of natural entities with indications of human involvement. River and irrigation, or forest and conservation, or sea (coughs) or flood. Another example is the predominance of risk words in these lists, not just uh, words such as risk and hazard, but also stress along with water, um, or problem along with environment. And there are words about uh, mitigating risk, mitigation with carbon, or protect with coastal, and so on. So to summarise, I've argued that in corpus-driven research in particular, the data is rearranged to enhance observation. Corpus-driven research takes a naive view of language, finding strings of of letters or words, strings of words or phrases, and applying insightful observation to them. And I think this is what uh, the numbers, in fact, are doing for us. So in this case, this is why I say that numbers-based corpus research is the new corpus-driven. It is statistics rather than concordancing that's used to rearrange the words. The work is as linguistically naive, taking a bag of words approach, and the rearrangement is followed by insightful, we hope, observation. I'm now going to turn to the fourth theme I'm talking about is the cognitive effect. Uh, Cognitive linguistics is not something that I have been involved with myself, but many of our new colleagues here at Birmingham work in cognitive linguistics. And I have been heard to say, if anybody else mentions the word eye tracker to me, I shall scream. (laughs) But clearly there's a growing affinity between cognitive and corpus approaches to language, and we are all very good friends, eye trackers notwithstanding. (laughs) From my very partial perspective, cognitive linguistics is about the study of metaphor and the study of construction grammar, and I'm going to focus on the second of these today. So constructions are mental constructs, mapping form and meaning, existing at all generalities of meaning. So, for example, a single word, the word apple, or the form of apple, or apple of someone's eye, and the meaning adored person. But also at a very general level, subject-verb inversion, with the meaning something like interrogative, or the ditransitive, transfer of possession, a positive as, causative into, or the conative at, meaning an incomplete action. So abstract grammatical features and particular grammatical (coughs) functions. Hang on, this one now. And corpus linguistics is, of course, important to constructions because corpus investigation allows for the identification of constructions in text. And this can be done from scratch, deriving techniques, as many have done, for recognising repeated strings or patterns of words that can then be proposed as evidence for the existence of constructions. What I'm going to propose here, though, is that previous work on corpus data can be put into service to identify constructions. A fairly obvious way to do this is to propose a reinterpretation of units of meaning, as proposed by Sinclair, as constructions. This is Sinclair's characterisation of a unit of meaning. One or more words, the form is variable but semi-fixed, the form is open to creativity, the meaning of the whole is more than the sum of the parts, the meaning is consistent, and the meaning is often affective and implicit. For example, a headline from earlier this month, UK ditches its cake and eat it Brexit stance. Um, The (laughs) phrase I am going to focus on here 
is cake and eat it. Uh, and if we look in a corpus, and the one I looked in was the Bank of English, we find cake and eat it, the string cake and eat it, 165 instances all preceded by have. So we can then look at have, cake and. Um, and if we look at the figures here, which is actually pretty impossible, um, have is the most frequent word form rather than other forms in the letter. And if we look at the possessives, it is relatively rarely, relatively rarely our or my. So although we can talk about have my cake and eat it, we're much more likely to talk about have your cake and eat it or have their cake and eat it. And the and eat it component um, is fairly fixed. Moving on, what is before have your possessive cake and? It's preceded by volition, wanting or trying to have your cake. It's also preceded by uh, modals of possibility and particularly negative ones. And there are some explicit instances of the affective meaning of the, of the uh, unit of meaning. He cannot have his cake and eat it. They both want to have their cake and eat it too. He accuses him of trying to have his cake and eat it. Maybe we just realise we can't have our cake and eat it. So thinking of this in terms of a unit of meaning, um, we've got a collocation, have cake, eat. We've got a colligation, the grammar. We've got modals, possessive, the coordinator. We've got a semantic set of wanting and trying and impossibility. And what we might, uh, the way we might express the semantic prosody is something like it's wrong to aim for two contradictory things. But of course we, can, we could also say what we have here is a have cake and eat it construction. And as we would expect from a construction, we can find a number of variations. Her tart and eat it, have your ham and eat it, their veal and eat it, have his beef cake and eat it, I do not understand at all. <laughs> their hamburgers and eat it, have their gatto and eat it, um, have your duck and eat it, um, have your loaf and eat it, and so on. We can do something very similar with another unit of meaning, again proposed by Sinclair, around the node sever, um, and he notes examples such as these here, and proposes uh, a unit of meaning which is with its own grammatical elements. So we've always got the word link, we've always got with or to, um, and we've very often got all, and if we don't have all, we've got um, a possessive. <coughs> of course there is variability in the noun. Ties is very common, links, connections, contacts relations, bonds, and so on. Uh, but there's also variability in the verb. So although sever, so I'm here looking for verb, all, ties, links, connections, contacts. Sever is the most frequent, but cut is also frequent, and a few others as well. Um, we can look at the preceding text and note that to is very frequent along with the verbs that go along with to like advise, decide, force. So we've got meanings of futurity, of volition and obligation. And then looking at the modifier, so I'm looking here at sever, space, ties, all is very frequent um, but also then the um, uh, the possessives. And I think the, that sense of absoluteness that we get with all permeates the unit. So we might say we have a several ties construction with 
the verbs sever, cut, break, the nouns, ties, links, connect, connections, with an implicature of absoluteness and an implicature of obligation um, and volition. The unit of meaning itself combines a several ties bit and a ties or links or connections followed by the prepositions with or to, and is probably a specification of a general destroy something construction, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. But my main um, proposal is that the work on patent grammar carried out in the 1990s by Jill Francis, Elizabeth Manning and myself can form the basis of construction identification. Um, the patent grammar resources are shortly, I hope, touch wood, shortly to be relaunched by Collins as an online free resource that will be searchable. And this resource, which is not quite ready to be launched on the general public yet, uh, was a subject of a workshop held last week here at Birmingham. And I'd like to thank the workshop participants for their contribution to some of the ideas here. They've also been used as the basis for construction recognition by, in the book by Ellis, Roma and MacDonnell, who investigate verb argument constructions in language acquisition using pattern grammar. Um, so grammar patterns are the systematization of the complementation patterns of adjectives, nouns and verbs. There are about a hundred main patterns with some other variations and there are approximately ten groups of meanings within each pattern. This means that we have the basis for about a thousand constructions, all at the same level of specificity. So to the construction grammar community, I offer a thousand constructions here for the taking. And many of the things that we call patterns have been investigated previously under the title of constructions by Goldberg, Greece, Stefanovic, Iltonen, uh, and others. So, for example, this one talked his way into, dismissed the idea as, fooled them into believing that, and told them a story. We can describe those as patterns, we can describe them as constructions, um, uh, either way. I'm now going to give examples from three other patterns, and in each case I'm going to focus on one meaning group within each pattern. So I'm going to find one common meaning from the several meanings expressed by the pattern. Um, and I'm going to propose as well that the pattern elements can be labelled semantically in a way that combines the concept of construction with related concepts of frames and local grammars. So it's well known that the it is adjective that pattern is used to evaluate. It's clear that, it's important that, it's interesting that, it's likely that, it's possible that. And here it is with the semantic elements added, an evaluation, and a target. I don't incidentally hold any great store by the labels given here, the, uh, um, the meaning labels, the element labels that are added. Uh, they're a best guess so far, um, but if somebody wants to change them, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, but I would suggest we have a reactive that construction where we have adjective plus that clause afraid that, aware that, confident that, disappointed that, happy that and again some possible suggested um, element names we have an evaluator, an evaluation and a target moving away from evaluative meanings something which I've called a reactive for construction this is the verb-noun-for-noun pattern 
blame someone for, criticise for, forgive my mother for, punish him for, reprimanded for, reward me for. Um, it is looking at this again from this rather new perspective, it seems that blame may not fit very well there because it is an afactual meaning, whereas the other are factual. Um, so I'll never forgive my mother for wrecking my marriage construes it as factual that the mother wrecked the marriage, whether or not she actually did, of no. course. Um, whereas blame the family for the predicament is, seems to me to be a little different, so we, we will remove that there. Um, and, but again, we have uh, some semantic labels. So we have a reactor, we have a reward or punish, we have a receiver, which is not a good label, but I um, can't think of anything else at the moment, and, and uh, the reason at the end. The relationship between construction and pattern is not one-to-one. -one. So here's a little table showing three patterns, but five constructions. So if we take the pattern adjective at noun, there is the construction person is skilled at activity with some sample nodes words, ace, adept, bad, brilliant, clever, competent, etc. Or person is reaction at situation. Uh, for example, he was furious at the adverse publicity with a few sample node words given there. So obviously it depends what kind of adjective it is as to which of those constructions it is. Um, and then the two patterns at the bottom of the table, verb noun, sorry, the one pattern at the bottom of the table, verb noun as noun, with the two constructions associated with it. Person categorizes entity as quality, as in they've denounced him as a madman, or entity strikes person as quality. This struck me as a great litmus test for new features with just two verbs um, that fit into that one. Uh, the pattern verb noun of noun has in the pattern grammar resource four meaning groups. Um, I'm going to ignore the last one, which is verbs we couldn't fit anywhere else <laughs> at the moment. Um, so there's rob and free, inform, acquit and convict. And for each group, we can again propose some labels. Um, with divided as to whether the taking away is a negative thing, as in defrauded, or a positive thing, as in cured. Another group would be the inform group with uh, labels such as informer, informed, and message. And I've separated out the bottom one, the broadcast convinced me, because the broadcast, of course, is not the informer, but the evidence of the, of the information. <coughs> now, um, the verb noun of noun pattern works quite well because there are relatively few um, meaning groups, so you've only got three constructions to the pattern. A much more difficult example is verb noun with noun, um, which has a lot of different meanings. Um, blend the spinach with the egg, lo egg yolks, uh, confuse cold with flu, education is correlated with income, console myself with writing up my notes, place football with the staff, stock up your cupboard with tins of tomatoes. There's not a great deal that's in common there. There are something like 29 meaning groups altogether in that pattern, but we can merge some of them together once we look at this from the point of view of constructions. Um, 
and this is what I've suggested altogether um, nine meanings rather than 29 um, and I'm not going to go through all of them um, but just the ones that I've put in bold there so we have I would suggest the meaning of effecting a, con a connection um, involve meanings of think of two things as connected or not combine two things physically or virtually exchange two things and I suggest that we might have a construe connection with construction uh, with a construer two entities and verbs such as confuse, combine or replace all of them with with the preposition with then we have a transfer ownership meaning with examples such as these ones uh, entrust with, furnish with honour with, inject with land with or provide with some positive uh, provide us with some negative land us with and we have a transferer a receiver and I suggest to provide someone with construction a meaning to do with bringing about a feeling or idea verbs to do with feelings and changes in mental state acquaint, bore, confront, familiarise, content a change in mental state a resultative mental with construction I'm trying to find names that sound construction-y that's <laughs> rather nice so in other words the proposal is the resources that are the outcome of extensive corpus research can be used to specify a very large set of constructions at a particular level of specificity the influence of cognitive linguistics on corpus linguistics can be positive using empirical research as the validation of observation it might also be negative and I confess this is a little bee in my bonnet um, cognitive linguistics quite, talks about identifying the psychological reality of certain linguistic effects and my only argument with that is an argument that psychological reality is the only reality and I don't like to see corpus linguistics adopting that view of it in order to be real it has to be demonstrated to be psychologically real and I may come back to that in just a moment as I get on to the final effect which I'm calling the paradigm effect so it's well known that language that can be investigated as a syntam or a paradigm. Syntagmatic, focusing on the order of elements. The paradigmatic, focusing on the choice between equivalent elements. And it seems to me that language can be investigated as a mental construct which tends to focus on the syntagmatic or as a social construct which tends to focus on the paradigmatic and when I say that I'm really thinking of social views of language such as systemic functional linguistics which is famously at its heart about choices between alternatives at all levels um, so language is represented as a system of choices and meaning depends on the available of alter uh, availability of alternatives choices are represented at progressive levels of delicacy and the system and the choices within it are socially rather than mentally motivated and some corpus work of course takes the SFL uh, categories as prior and quantifies them um, thereby, thereby adding to Halliday's work on probabilities within register but I'm not actually talking about that kind of work at the moment 
this seems to me to bring to mind these two words which I can barely pronounce and always have to look up to remind myself which one is which um, and so I uh, acknowledge here Wikipedia that um, reminded me today which one is which and gave the very nice examples of some theology saying what does a single entity mean, what does chip mean, well it means a different thing if you're in the UK and if you're in the USA which is a bit like saying how is this word or structure used which word or structure is more frequent etc the onomasiology one says if we have a particular concept what are the different names for it so what is the name of a piece of potato that has been fried in the UK it is one word in the USA it is another word the second of these seems to me in a sense to go into the paradigmatic and to present for corpus linguistics the old problem of how do you find something that is not there or how do you find something when you don't know what it is so when you know that something is not said how do you know what is being said instead? And in a sense, that's what you need to find out. Now, there are a little bit, there are some ways of doing this. So, for example, there are um, alternative <coughs> formulations of a function. So, there are, as Maggie Charles has suggested, you can talk about the results suggested that or you can say Darwin interpreted this as, and you've got two in, uh, alternative ways of reporting results that have very different effects. One of my favourites is looking at how modality can be expressed in different ways. We can look at modal verbs, and we have a list of those, so it's easy to find them but you come across alternative ways of expressing modality um, and one that I discovered by chance almost was the phrase for fear of which uh, expresses modality without uh, modal meaning without a modal verb um, and then an adjective discovered uh, by our colleague Gary Plappert was candidate uh, as in candidate gene which means this is the gene that might do this uh, but doesn't actually use the modal verb. And then I want to look a little bit further at the notion of the paradigmatic in terms of levels of delicacy or levels of specificity in constructions. And here I'm indebted to a, a paper by Weibel and Sal that introduced this idea to me quite recently. And I want to do this just with a couple of examples that uh, at the bottom of the table on the screen you see a set of constructions of the type I was talking about before um, where you have a range of um, verbs uh, that can be used um, for example with solve a problem there are other words that can be used with solve a problem, address a problem, attack, beat, fix, solve, settle, sort. Answer a need can be answer, fill, meet. Break a habit can be break or kick. Handle a situation can be control or handle or improve or save. Treat a disease can be fight or treat. Um, and remove an obstacle, I think I only found remove. So all those lists of verbs come from the grammar patterns uh, resource that I was talking about earlier. But all of those are examples of a more general meaning that one might call overcome a negative situation, which in turn is uh, an example of something more general which we might call abstract effects situation, which in turn is part of a more general construction of the transitive construction or the pattern verb noun and alongside that 
still in the transitive construction verb noun, as well as abstract affects situation, we've got another alternative within that pattern, which we might call entity affects entity, which of which a specific example might be person destroys abstract, and that is where we get down to the specific construction or unit of meaning of sever all ties. So each of our specific constructions is an example of a more general one. And one of the issues that came up in our workshop last week was finding the level of specificity of the various constructions we were talking about. So, the summary of what I've been saying. I made five points. Specialisation broadens the scope of corpus linguistics. New forms of communication, new forms of corpora, lead to an explosion of new methods. Numbers-based manipulation of word forms is the new corpus-driven. Existing research can be used to identify a thousand constructions. And the social is as important as the cognitive, and the paradigm is as important as the syntax. And with my final little dinosaur, <laughs> colour coordinated, you notice, <laughs> I would like to uh, wish you a very pleasant conference, and I look forward to seeing you during the rest of the week. Thank you.